Hi, I'm Paul Nabil, Syrian American, and this is Start Here. What the hell is a source? You and I are in an online forum right now, which means both of us have been in an argument before. Usually what that devolves into at some point is one side or the other saying, well, share your source. At that point, somebody shares a link or an article or a book, and then they stick with that for the rest of the debate as their source, and nothing ever gets resolved. Well, why is that? As my brother, who is a super fancy research scientist and professor, always says, one paper is a pretty low currency. The reason for that is, in the end, we're all just humans trying to figure out how the world works, which means there's no such thing as something that is truly unbiased. Lack of bias doesn't exist, and if someone ever tells you, my point of view is unbiased, that immediately should let you know that they don't know how bias works. And because every source, in the end, is written by a human being or a group of human beings, or at this point, an AI that was trained on sources written by human beings, it means it's actually probably going to be pretty straightforward for anybody to go out and find some source or even group of sources that agree with them. Which is why, right here at the beginning, I want to establish the concept of due diligence and academic rigor. Citing our sources will, whenever possible, never be about citing a single paper or article or essay or YouTube video or even book, institute, organization, news organization, group of news organizations, single country's news organizations. It is always going to be about finding the broad consensus based on our process of doing our due diligence, of identifying and sifting through various levels of bias, intention, and motivation that allows us to reach the most informed decision through a process of rigorous research. I understand that most people will not read every source I mention. I just need to make sure that I maintain some level of trust and integrity in this online educational relationship that people in general trust that I am approaching this subject in good faith, that I have maintained my own level of due diligence and integrity and academic rigor when discussing this subject. Said a different way, we don't give special priority to any one authority. And if it seems like we do, it's because that particular source has earned a reputation of proper vetting, due diligence, and fact-checking over time. And if we have this approach of identifying and sifting through bias and motivation to come to a broad consensus of academic study, that is when we start to have our expectations challenged. And one of the really fun things is by taking this approach to sources, we can start to examine not only the bias of a particular source, but also our own biases. So for example, if we read an article that clearly doesn't support Israel, we can start to examine our own reaction to that and see if there's some bias that we need to address within ourselves. So perhaps this source is not useful, but also maybe our reaction to that is also not useful. If we have a preconceived notion in our head that anybody who doesn't support Israel must to some extent also not support the Jewish people as a whole, then we have the option of projecting that onto the author of a particular source, or we can examine that bias within ourselves and see which holds up to better scrutiny. If you have the preconceived notion that anybody who is anti-Zionist is also anti-Semitic, they don't like Jewish people, well, the immediate challenge to that would be how many Jewish people are anti-Zionist. Which, as I mentioned in my previous video, there are many. But there are other challenges that are less intuitive. For example, how many people support Zionism who are also anti-Semitic? It turns out, at least arguably, the majority of people who support Israel and Zionism are actually Christian fundamentalists, many of whom are also anti-Semitic. Which may or may not convince you one way or the other, but it certainly has represented a new way of thinking that you may not have considered before. And now suddenly, instead of simply labeling an article as black or white, for or against, now we have added some nuance that deserves further investigation. One of the ways I hope to demonstrate just how asymmetrical the situation is and how invalid it is to represent both sides as in some way equivalent is by showing just how drastic the difference is when we look at sources from both sides of the debate. People who do not benefit in any way 
from speaking up for Palestinian liberation still continue to do so, who may even be putting themselves in harm's way just to speak up for Palestine, and how drastically more difficult it is to find any examples of that happening on the other side of the debate. And finally, just be wary that one of the most common tactics of people speaking against Palestinian liberation is to copycat the talking points of that movement and try and apply it to themselves. But those kinds of talking points are very brittle. They do not stand up to academic rigor or due diligence. And I hope by establishing this framework early on, we can learn to identify when that happens, not just in sources, but also in the preconceived notions that we ourselves have. And instead of being bothered by that happening, by becoming upset or angry whenever we make a mistake or are wrong or are corrected, instead cultivate a feeling of excitement because it is yet another opportunity to unlearn some bullshit. <laughs> Next up, we're gonna do a definition of terms and then I think probably a historical overview.